Hello, everyone. Hello, Chris. Hello, Rich. How are we doing? Oh, yeah, wonderful, wonderful. So this week, it, of course, is the 20th uh, Congress of the Communist Party of China. Very important, big political meeting for them. That's what we're going to be talking about. And the first thing I want to say, just a tiny little thing, which has really been irritating me, and it's been irritating me for a very long time, is when people say CCP, the CCP, it's not. It's the CPC, okay? So it's the Communist Party of China. That is the official name. And even if you go on Wikipedia, it says CPC. However, the uh, wonderful editors and information gatekeepers of Wikipedia still try and assert that it's the CCP. Um, it's not. It's the CPC. Okay. There we go. Now that that's out of the way. Um, where did you want to start on, Chris? How do you want to begin this very big, important thing that we're discussing? So, obviously, this is this is an incredibly important event. Basically, this is outlining the next five years' uh, development for China and electing the governance going forward. Uh, before we really start that, I just feel like we need to discuss the elephant in the room as it is being made in Western media. Um mm very unfortunately is the situation that we saw on the final day with Hu Jintao. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so mm -hmm. I don't know if we've got a video of that. I should look for one shortly. Um, uh, I've got one, I've got one. Perfect. So we'll just pull that up just so people can see what it is we're actually referring to. And yeah. yeah, sure, sure. I'll put that up right now. Um... <clears throat> Sorry, where is it going? Here we go. Okay, so yeah, if you're not aware, that's Hu Jintao. Hu Jintao is the former leader, the last leader of um, China, the before Xi Jinping. And this is what happened on the last day of the Congress. That's right. Uh, there was actually a bit of a high drama, at least by Chinese standard, uh, during the closing ceremony. In videos and images, we actually saw former Chinese top leader Hu Jintao, who is Mr. Xi's predecessor, uh, got let out of the room, uh, accompanied by uh, two male staff members in the middle of the ceremony. Now, Hu was uh, seen having a brief conversation with the two men and appearing to be reluctantly uh, let out. And before that, he also uh, seemed to have had a brief chat with Xi Jinping and uh, then patted on the shoulder of Premier Li Keqiang on his way out. Now, because of the opaque nature of Chinese politics, we are not clear about the circumstances surrounding this very surprise, uh, uh, surprise moment. And actually, uh, state media here has not reported this at all. And as soon as we started talking about this, the Chinese censors blocked CNN signal here in China. But um, it is just quite the uh, an ex All right, I guess enough. Um, so, Chris, yeah, yeah what, what do you want to say about that? So um, one thing that they're not really pointing out very well is that he was also escorted in in the first place. Now, we've got a lot of the Western media. They like to paint a picture without very much evidence. Uh, one thing that they're saying, as they've just said in there, Chinese censors aren't letting us do this, do that. Like, well, what aren't they letting you do? Because you've just shown the, the video that we've just seen that we've just seen that on Western mm -hmm. media. Chinese mm -hmm. government have come out and said that he was ill. The fact that he was escorted in suggests that. I've mm -hmm. seen some... The, the obvious, the ex, the extreme uh, explanation for it, people have said, oh, this is a power play by Xi that he was purged. Right. Now, in, in, without solid information, we have to resort to common sense. Now, if I was going to purge people that I wanted to not vote, I wouldn't be purging them on the last day. I'd be purging them at the beginning of the Congress so they can't vote, so they can't take part in the in the events that are just going to... Why why would you do this at the end when it's already been done? He did. Yeah. He does look ill. He is frail. Now, one of the things that they've also been saying is that uh, the Chinese government haven't made a comment. They have. They've said that he is unwell. Another yeah. thing that they've also now been saying is that all reference to him has been um, removed. Now, if we can just pull up this second link here that I've just shared. Gotcha, yeah. So this is part of the text from the disciplinary, disciplinary inspection, part of the report from this Congress on, on, the, on the last one. So if you just <laughs> scroll down to the Congress calls on the Central Committee and Local Commission, 
or discipline mm. inspection to hold there high the great banner of socialism with Chinese characteristics, uphold Marxist Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, Deng Xiaoping theory, the theory of the three represents the scientific outlook of development. The scientific outlook of development, this is. Uh, Hu Jintao. That's Hu Jintao. Yeah. Hu Jintao. Yeah, Hu Jintao. Yeah, Hu Jintao. This, this was his history. contribution uh, to the Constitution. So. Straight away, these allegations of oh he he's been purged and all mention of this has been removed. Mm -hmm. This would be the first thing that you do go after if you, that was mm -hmm. the case, which is evidently not. Mm -hmm. There's no point removing a man at this point. He's not even on the on the this yeah. year's Politburo standing committee. Yeah, yeah, no, so one hundred percent. These are the things uh, that he should have removed if that Western narrative was true. And the fact that they right. haven't removed it indicates to me common right, sense right, right, right. that it's not true and that he is ill this is an old man in a country that does have yeah. high levels of alzheimer's yeah 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 so yeah i've heard people say that he's you know people are saying that he has alzheimer's um i saw as you probably did and as you heard in that cnn article sorry his piece there uh i heard from the bbc or read from the bbc ah yes um it could be that he's unhealthy and he's unwell uh, because he was led in, as you said, he was he was he was um, escorted on. But they didn't, you know, then resist with speculating that it was this insane political stunt. Um, yeah. And lots of commentators have already said that this whole affair is obviously very organized, very well crafted, very well thought out. Um, so to have a very, um, you know, unpredictable thing as if to drag out the previous leader in front of the whole party, in front of sat whoever's next left to party. Sat, Xi Jinping. Right, sat next to Xi. Yeah, you, 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 I mean, the other thing that I, you know, think about this is that I lived in China for three and a half years and yeah. Chinese culture in terms of conflict and in terms of doing things like this and if there isn't a disagreement or something like that, it's never done in what in that kind of way, if that ever was going to be, which it really definitely wasn't. It's a very un-Chinese thing to do in terms of just the social norms and social culture. You would never, yeah. ever see yeah. something like that, um, dragging someone out um, as a show of power. No, no, it doesn't yeah. happen. And the, the, this yeah. wasn't that. This wasn't dragging out. These, these were AIDS. Now, if you compare this to, uh, obviously, the North Korean Congress a couple of years ago where uh, Kim Jong-un's uncle was arrested, mm. which was very much what they're saying this was mm -hmm. soldiers escorting someone out arrested very clear arrested mm -hmm. the the aesthetics of it are completely different this this is very much an old yeah. man who yeah probably wanted to go to an event saying that he was well enough to go and then well i mean also i think that, yeah yeah and, and like you said if there was something like that where she wanted to make a show against the previous era, the previous um, guys who who's whose guys, and you know, obviously that era there's a lot of corruption problems and whatever. Um, she did make um, some sort of you know big statement or big arrest against the rivals of the time. Bo Shilai um, was you know done for corruption, uh, his yeah. wife as well, and there was a you know court case, and he went to court, and it was pictures of him, whatever. But he did that in the first year of his term. So again, like you said, if he was going to do this, he would never do it now. Um, he could have easily done it back then in 2013 or any time in the last 10 years. Um, yeah. He could have built a case for it. To do an arbitrary just pulling away is just insane. It, it's in crazy. It's a, it's crazy talk. It's it's this is the problem is that it it lives inside this realm of Western depictions of China, which are insane. They're either ungrounded or just all murky and everything's gray. And I mean, there's certain things that are literally so stupid as they choose a particular filter when they show you footage of Beijing, they show a certain color. They don't show you the real color. So you're, it's literally comes down to the actual color of buildings that you're looking at has an actual tint. So, that, I mean, that's a, that's, that's a, a well-documented thing. People have shown the videos of that Beijing scene that, that the West was showing, Western media was showing, and you see the difference in color. I mean, they, they have an actual filter. And they do this stuff with, you know, old Soviet films or whatever. But the point is, is that they definitely do it with China. And so this idea of um, him being escorted as a show of power just lives in the pure fantasy uh, of the, the gray tinted worldview 
of of the West on 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 on, on China on, on Beijing. But yeah. yeah, and it goes into the sort of fan fiction that the West loves with their media. If it was only last month that the yeah. Indian tabloid started writing the story that uh, Xi had been purged in a military coup in China. Right, and, right, 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 right. It somehow spread in, into the Western uh, narrative, and. Uh, like, is this true? Is she under house arrest? Of the military taken mm. over? Mm. It was a hot topic mm. for 24 hours and literally it just was. existed in the mind yeah. of some journalists in India <laughs> and it spread from there. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what's that expression? Yeah, so uh, conspiracies about China living rent free in millions of Westerners' minds. They are. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I just want to show something quickly before we get into some of the meat and bones and potatoes of the. Uh, of the, this conference, just so that people can recap on the past. Because, um, you know, there's quite a lot of, I mean, you might not necessarily know all of the leaders of the party and who they were and uh, which eras or what. Obviously, we're not going to give you a full detailed um, breakdown of each era, but just a sort of nice little dark um, little thing I found from, from the visual capitalist, uh, actually. Um, it's a nice little thing. I mean, I'm sure it does have, its, it does have some biases, I think, but... Um, Overall, it's not the worst thing I've ever seen. Uh, here we go. So if you take a look there, seven years of economic development and policy in the People's Republic of China. Okay, so this obviously takes us to 2019. So just to recap, if you're not familiar, Mao Zedong, 1949. On this red side here, you've got economic growth. Okay, so that's per capita, I believe. Um, yes, per capita GDP. Okay, and then you've got certain events, economy in blue and uh, government is red, social is yellow. Okay. Um, so yeah, founded in 1949. Obviously you have things like the Great Leap, uh, first five-year plans, um, where steel production went up, um, various conferences and whatnot. Then you obviously have uh, the Cultural Revolution in 1966 up to 76. Uh, I just want to make one note here is that even, um, you know, obviously let's, well, the, this, the data doesn't have to, the, the, the data is not here for 1949, but you know, even here you're seeing constant economic growth. Obviously, there are some years, 61, where there's a drop. Um, um, but you can still see, and 67, 69, but if you take the general trend, it, it was always going up, up and up and up, up. And yeah, in the 70s here, and of course, then it does increase, um, you know, quite a lot. But I think the real takeoff point is obviously 2001. That's where you see a real huge uh, jump. But bear in mind, this is per capita. So... Um, I do have another statistic we can look at later, but the actual GDP overall is actually quite high. There's some instances where it's 20%, uh, 15% around here in, this, um, in the 60s and, and, and in the 70s. Um, and then, of course, after 78, that's the, pop, the point that everyone always likes to reference being the, the, the real economic boom. But you can still see economic growth here. Um, yeah. And I just want to mention another thing is uh, this is a statistic from... from uh, one moment. Uh, I believe it's a nutrition. Uh, um, uh, one second. It's from the. One moment. Life expectancy. Yeah, it's talking about life from PubMed. PubMed. Yeah. Um, which is, uh, yeah, an American website, I believe. And they're talking about life expectancy in China. It was 36. So life expectancy here was 36 years old. <laughs> and now life expectancy, actually, which I'll get up in a moment. Uh, has overtaken the U.S. So Chinese life expectancy is now higher than American life expectancy because of COVID and other factors, but primarily because of COVID right now. Um, yeah. So there's a little statistic there. So and just to, to just to recap on who's who, there's Mao, then you have Deng Xiaoping, then you have Jiang Zemin, then you have Hu Jintao, and then you have Xi Jinping. So who is the guy that was um, you know taken out of the conference because of I believe medical reasons, uh, Alzheimer's and whatnot, but. This guy here, Jiang Zemin, is also still alive, but he's 96. Um, he's pretty frail. Uh, yeah. I think we last saw him in 2019 at an event. So he's. Uh, so this is the. Um, it would have been presiding over his contribution, would have been the three represents. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, under him, China got Hong Kong back. Did it get Macau? Macau. No, Macau was afterwards, yeah. wasn't it? No, no, no. It's still Macau. Yeah, he, Macau's here. Ah, 99, Macau. Macau. Yeah, so, so he, 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 he hands over in 2002 to, to Hu Jintao. And uh, so he did, he did Hong Kong and Macau, and then obviously he carried on. He's, um, yeah, seen as very market friendly, and he pushed. Uh, so there's also some confusing bits here. So even though Deng Xiaoping uh, hands over in 1989, 
to Jiang Zemin. Um, you have the famous speech where Deng Xiaoping's southern tour. So in 1992, Deng Xiaoping goes to Shenzhen and he makes a famous speech about opening up, the need to open up and accelerate the reform process and, and whatnot. And he's obviously saying that while Jiang Zemin is actually the head. So that just shows you some, some peculiarity about Chinese leadership or the CPC's leadership that you can have um, a, a prominent person, um, you know, a former leader, have some influence and sway over where the things go, um, even though they don't hold the uh, general secretary or the chairman uh, position at the time. Um, yeah. yeah. So, I'll just so in a there. contrast with that to sort of American politics where, or mm -hmm. even British politics, where one leader can come in and be the uh, opposite of the previous one, undo the previous administration's policies, like where Trump came in and his, his whole platform was, I'm going to get rid of everything that Obama did. And then yeah. obviously Biden's the complete opposite of that. I'm going to come in and get rid of everything that Trump mm -hmm. did on paper. Mm -hmm. um, and it just mm -hmm. sort of seems like a, a vicious cycle of, are we actually getting anywhere with every four years is just dedicated to undoing the last four years where Chinese right. uh, leadership, a lot of it is about showing um, continue our, continuality and, and growth. Mm -hmm. It's a continuation mm -hmm. of policies. You very rarely would you get a Chinese leader who's come in to promise to undo the efforts of the of the last one. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. That, that, I mean, that, that's also, yeah, one of the huge strengths. I mean, you have in terms of then just having a plan that's further than the current um, current administration. You know, yeah. yeah, you can you can think 15, 25. I mean, this is one of the things that, that she talks about um, in this uh, in this Congress is about the second uh, centenary goal. Do you think does Britain have a single centenary goal? Does the does the US have a centenary goal? Who else has got a centenary goal? Huh? Huh? Well, yeah. in Britain, we're pretty much living leadership month by month at the moment. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. No, we got monthly goals. Yeah. We just got <laughs> lettuce goals. Yeah. Your lettuce but, goals. Um, <laughs> lettuce by lettuce. That's that's our leadership in, in the UK at the moment. But yeah. Um, I think hmm. one of the things that um, these sort of this policy of continuation with China goes to is something that I, I thought that I had a few days ago that when we've been really honest with ourselves, it sort of speaks in favor of a one party system rather than a two. Where a, in a two party system or multiple party system, you make promises to undercut the other side. So say if the Tories come out in Britain and they have a good idea, Labour have to oppose it on the grounds that the Tories said it. It's like, well, actually, yeah. it was good. Like like what some people would argue with Brexit, because the Tories were in favour of it, Labour had to be opposed a bit. And mm -hmm. that's how it is. If you if you can't vote with them because they're the opposition. Where yeah. in a one-party system such as China, they're the only people they've got to answer to is the populace mm -hmm. is their own population if they mm. people chinese people of china see that the government isn't doing what it promised to do isn't representing their needs and their their wishes they'd be removed mm. and it's not silly to suggest that china have removed governments before that's how exactly how the chinese communist party got there in the first place through revolution oh, yeah yeah i think this idea that the, the chinese are placid and would just let themselves live if they didn't actually like um, their government. I think that's a ridiculous idea. They, yeah, they've, they have a history of of happily overthrowing the rulers of their country if they don't like them. Yeah. Um, actually, I, I do want to contest something that with uh, it's not actually a one party state. Um, there are actually no. other parties, and I'll, I'll bring this up now. It's a nice little thing that CGTN made um, a few years ago. I think for a previous, actually for the CP CPPCC. Uh, and if you don't know what that is, we're going to show you right now. So it isn't. Um, strictly a one-party state because there are the parties and this is what they do and this is what they look like. How does China's political system work? China has a unique multi-party cooperation system. It differs both from the pluralist party systems common in the West and one-party systems in use elsewhere. What does this mean in practice? The Communist Party of China, or CPC, acts as the ruling party, but cooperates with eight other groups to discuss and manage state affairs. The eight parties are the Revolutionary Committee of the Chinese Kuomintang, China Democratic League, China Democratic National Construction Association, 
China Association for Promoting Democracy, Chinese Peasants and Workers Democratic Party, China Jurgong Party, Jusan Society, and Taiwan Democratic Self-Government League. The Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, or CPPCC, facilitates multi-party cooperation and political consultation under the leadership of the CPC and is an important instrument of democracy. The system encourages parties, organizations, and representatives from across Chinese society to discuss basic policy, as well as consult on important political, economic, cultural, and social issues. Every year during the two sessions, the CPPCC receives thousands of policy proposals from members. This year, among the 5,769 suggestions, 4,279 were put on record and 42 marked as key proposals. This, along with people's congresses, regional ethnic autonomy, and self-governance at the village level, constitutes the fundamental framework of China's political system and is the embodiment of the nation's socialist democracy. So there you go. That's what that looks like, CPPCC. A bit of a mouthful. Um, and film the movie is a little bit, a little bit childish, but I don't know. It's, it's just their style, cartoonish, I guess, for that, for that, for that particular one. But yeah, um, I yeah, think so there's that, a particular. That is really interesting. Interesting. Yeah, just one of the things particular that particular point out was one of the parties in that group, uh, the Revolutionary mm -hmm. Committee of the Chinese Kuomintang. Obviously, a mm -hmm. few people when they heard that would have ears perked up and thought Kuomintang. Uh, obviously, the, this is the left wing of the original Kuomintang party who lost the mm -hmm. civil war against uh, the communists. Uh, the obviously mm -hmm. the right wing of of the Kuomintang, instead of admitting defeat, they ran away to Taiwan and um, I've, I've been there to this day and, and have set up a government there in essentially a government in exile mm -hmm. I think a lot of people in the West don't re quite realise what Taiwan is when they hear that what are they, are they a country, why aren't they a country and mm -hmm. this, is, this is sort of exactly why but it's quite interesting that the left wing sort of did get uh, co-opted and admitted in to mm -hmm. the official mm -hmm. Chinese government to work yeah with them and so this is mm -hmm. there was a great the time video that you just played there because obviously I, I said that these a one party system in terms of having opposition parties but these parties aren't opposition these right. are good point partners mm. these work with rather than against yeah yeah i think there's a particular word so when people talk about democracy there is actually different types of democracy so you have you know direct democracy representative democracy, consultative democracy. Um, so something like Brexit is direct democracy, where every, everyone literally votes on a particular issue. But that's obviously not functional because we can't constantly having be having votes on everything. So then you have representatives, which is what a parliament is or a congress, or even what you have here with, with the party and the delegates. So not the CPCC, but the actual congress happening now is, is delegates, uh, elected um, individuals from the party going and, and then uh, discussing and voting. Um, you know, as this is would. what this uh, is, that goes into the idea of um, workplace democracy. Like, if yeah. if if you if you've got an issue that directly affects uh, carers of the elderly, mm. a bricklayer wouldn't have the information necess necessary to vote on those issues. You'd leave that issue to people who actually work in that field. So, of course, mm. it makes sense for a bricklayer to not be consulted or given a vote to vote on issues regarding to carers of the elderly. And vice versa. Yeah, 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 yeah. And also, I think that that the, the CPP, the CPPCC thing, is also is representative as well as consultative. So, I mean, there's a whole bunch of other stuff. So, it's it's quite a massive system. How, it's, as they allude to there, with the autonomous regions and all these other bodies, is that you do have all this consultation happening all the time. So, it's not like uh, the CPC just makes policies up and just hands them down from the top. I'd say they're, they're far more built up from the bottom, you know, speaking to industry experts, speaking to workers, speaking to peasants, speaking to whoever, and then also looking at technocratic stuff too, um, in terms of, you know, that input as well, and then coming to conclusions as to what policies are, and then yeah, having having an actual mechanism for for bottom uh, bottom up proposals. Um, yeah, so it's not a it's a very uh, interesting uh, thing, and it's it's 
I've always painted as being this opaque um, and monolithic uh, thing, as if the party is just one giant thing with 97 million members that don't have any brain and just think, uh, actually don't think at all. That, that's apparently what, what what's going on, which is ridiculous yeah. if you think about how many people are involved um, and how many different uh, actions are on it, it. It seems like a waste of time. If it's all a charade, it's a very expensive charade. If, yeah. you know, if they could just be uh, complete autocrats. But <laughs> yeah. And with an army that size, you they could if they wanted to be. Right. I mean, yeah, it'd be very easy to be autocratic, super, or, you know, deeply autocratic. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, so I think it's something that's quite interesting. People don't realize the level of discussion, at basically all levels of Chinese society that goes on, where mm. everything is as, as it was in the Soviet Union. Um, but with, with the nature of China, uh, with the Soviet Union, literally every time there was a discussion, if two or more people mm. discuss something in, in a room, there'd be a fourth person writing it down. Um, and that would then get <laughs> sent to the printing presses and that would be, be released as a pamphlet. China don't seem to, to, to do that in the same level as the Soviet Union does. So we, we know these discussions mm. do go on. Um, unfortunately, mm. we're not always privy to the, the notes and the minutes. And Frankly, mm. there's that mm. many of them. I, I doubt anybody would have the time to read them if, they, if it was. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you've but got yeah, a party of like 97 million people. Yeah, there's, there's more people in that party than there are in the UK. So imagine, imagine reading exactly. the notes of everyone's conversations of something the size of the UK plus another whatever, 20 or 30 million people. So yeah. 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 It's, um, yeah. Just so we can understand um, the relationship then between what we have now, the Congress and the CPPCC, um, there's a video here I'm going to play. This is from a very China hating channel. So I'm going to have to try and dodge all of the propaganda, but I'll, I'll do my best. So I'm going to play a few, few, few clips from clips from here. We can, we can stop and start along the way, Chris, if you've got anything to add on um, what, what we're going to see here. Um, so this, this does explain... Uh, a bit more of the relationship between how the CPPCC works and the Congress works. Yeah. One second, here we go. Because the first thing is over here is talking about the age stuff. And each successive leader from Mao Zedong to Deng Xiaoping to Jiang Zemin to Hu Jintao was less powerful than the last. Okay, so that's just the timeline again. Um, just a quick point, he mentions the age limit, which is quite important. So they put a 68 year age cap um, for central committee members. And then obviously I think also for the Politburo, well, that would apply to the Politburo too. Um, which, <laughs> which if you think about some of the leadership in America and I don't know, in many places around the world, it does seem like a good idea to have an age limit, an age cap. I don't know what yeah. your thoughts on that, Chris. Completely. This is, this was one of my main sort of criticism, one of my many criticisms when Biden uh, was elected in the states. That like you need to stop electing OAPs. Like it yeah. shouldn't have to be a worry. Will this president actually su survive his term, or is it going to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the U.S. one is is particularly bad. I mean, yeah, it's, it's the biggest Nancy example. Pelosi is, oh, pardon? It's the biggest example. Yeah, I think, and also it's at a particularly bad time, even by American standards. I mean, Ronald Reagan was 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 you know was senile by the time he finished, but you've got Nancy Pelosi who's over eighty. I think there's some congressmen who are borderline ninety. Uh, might even be yeah. one of them that's a senator that's over ninety. Biden, if he runs, which I don't think he should, he will be eighty-two when he finishes or more. I think eighty-three. Um, Sanders is pretty much, I think, seventy-nine. Uh, it's just not looking good. Yeah, these guys are all of them are 10, 10 or twelve or fifteen years older than than what China is allowing. So basically, yeah, you get to sixty eight, you can maybe overserve if you're if depending on how it overlaps with with the, with the, the, the five year term. But effectively, sixty eight is, is kind of the end of the end of the game for you. Except of course for the actual chairman himself, who can go a bit a bit further. But there yeah. are term limits, which have this is the big discussion, of course, of the third term that that. Um, that she has so been, even, uh, even within China, up. Xi Jinping is sixty nine. Obviously, he, he, mm. he seems in in good health. I dare mm. say I could win mm. him in a race if if it came down to it. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. he, he doesn't seem to be um, yeah. on his last legs like we, we've seen yeah. some other nations' leaders be. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, the next thing I want to show this one here is a uh, quick one. 
This year, for example, is the 20th Party Congress, which began on October 16th, 2022. So just a quick snapshot there of the past. So the first one, excuse this stupid subtext here. First one is July 1921. So yeah, just over 100 years ago. And they used to have one every year then, 22, 23. And then when you get to 1925, two years, one year. And there's a really big gap here, which, of course, they had a Congress in 1928, the sixth Congress, and then didn't have one for nearly 20 years. Um, and obviously, this is because of the Japanese invasion and fighting the Kuomintang. So they had then had a Congress in 1945. And then because of the Civil War, and not another one again for till 56. And then so on and so forth, you know, 69, 73. And then I think they get they got into the rhythm of of the five years that there are now in 77. So one in 1977, 82, 87, 92, 97, and so on and so forth. So the, the two and the seven pattern starts from 77. Yeah, every five years. Uh, any thoughts you know, to add on that, Chris? Um, no? So one thing I just wanted to quick point out, because it was just mentioned about the term limits. Yes. So there was a lot of um, noise in the West last year when the... I think it was last year or yeah. So when China removed term limits, so yeah. allowing G to potentially run for a third time, which he has now done and been successful. So he will serve another five year term. Yeah. And the, uh, the way the Western media portrayed that was, Oh, this is groundwork for president for life. How undemocratic is it to have removed these term limits? I can I, I give America media, they, they can have that argument because they do have those term limits. But British yes. news also said it, which I thought was interesting because we don't have term limits in this country either. We can keep running to be prime minister as long as we keep winning. I didn't know that. Okay. Interesting. So it's, it sort of felt like something that we were accusing somebody <laughs> of doing the same thing that we're doing. <laughs> In theory, yeah, sort of, yeah, the, the American, yeah, like the American yes, going, <laughs> yeah, the American going, yeah, term limits, and then what, we just sort of just joining in, yeah, those term limits, yeah, what about <laughs> yeah, that we don't have? <laughs> Hold on, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, that, that's, I don't know that. That's interesting. That's it, it's a very strange criticism to make of something it that you don't practice. Yeah, <laughs> that just sounds like you're joining in. You're joining in. Yeah, I'm gonna jump ahead to a quick one about here about the. Uh, uh, so this one is about the jargon. Okay, so there's obviously this is quite a thing that we've already alluded to here. Okay, so there's a couple of phrases that you will always see within, um, particularly in Xi's book, uh, one of Xi's books. He has you know three or four of them now, um, but you have these jargon terms here. So let's just pause there for now. There's many of them. So things like three represents that comes from um, Jiang Zemin's era. You have uh xi jinping thought of course that's named after xi jinping hunting tigers and swatting flies that's talking about hunting corruption so the tigers are the big officials and the flies are the little ones um there's the chinese dream you have the core socialist values which are the, the 12 values which we can list later but there is a quite a confusing i i agree that this is a little bit confusing when you read um you know the party literature the hard literature but i mean obviously if you're talking about people that are running a country with scientific socialism um, you end up with jargon, with terms, any, any specialized knowledge, medicine, yeah. engineering, whatever has jargon and specialized language. And this is just what they have. So yeah, if you do read, um, a communist party text and you sort of go, what is going on? Don't worry. It's because it's, you know, it's, it's complex stuff and they need to have these shorthand for expressions. You're not, um, you know, you're not crazy or anything. It's just, uh, it's just very dense. That's all. That's quite, um, but politicians, yeah. In, in China, you, you're expected to know your, your country's history. So I think a lot of the confusion starts. If you're going to start learning Chinese political science starting yeah. from 2022, you're not going to understand any of these terms. You need, unfortunately, you need to have started from the beginning. So you do right. need to sort of go back to trace where then you'll see these terms appear first time, develop, and yeah. you'll sort of learn them a little bit. You can't, yeah, you can't yeah. jump into the fourth book and expect to know yeah. what's going on. No, yeah, you're absolutely right. It, it is, it, yeah, it's, it's a bit overwhelming to try and jump in um, and, and try and sort of just come out with it with a layman's understanding, yeah. even just a basic understanding, yeah. Um, okay, so I'm just going to, what's happening now? There we go, it's loading. Um, 
So let's put this up here. Again, no laws are being written here, only ideological statements. Okay, so that's a good point that it's actually not a law setting um, thing. But let's just jump ahead to the candidates over here, which is over here. Um, for 204 seats, giving them the option to reject just 9%. The ads, sorry, excuse the ads. But yeah, so out of the, so 2,000 delegates go to the Congress, which yeah. are elected from all over the country. So all sorts of um, places, so cities and rural areas, as well as um, basically wherever the party is, they send yeah. Um, yeah. a delegate from their I'll do branch. a little breakdown here. So out of 97 million members, you've got 2,300... 2,300 delegates from the National Congress. That makes 205 members of the Central Committee, 25 members of the Politburo, and then seven members of the Standing Committee. Standing Committee. There you go. You've got it. So Chris is already sure. I'll, I'll, I'll then not play this one because you've already, you've already said it there. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 The only thing I want to add to it then is just the relationship between party and state. So, well, yeah. Actually, I will play this because actually it's quite a nice graphic. So, but it is it is what you just said. More people so. then became members of the Central Committee, the next level up in the party hierarchy. There are almost as many alternates who attend meetings but aren't allowed to vote. They can replace full members when they die or lose their positions. The Central Committee meets at least once a year in what's called a plenum, and the first plenum occurs the day after the party congress ends. This year on October twenty third. Their most important task is to elect members of the 25-member Political Bureau, or Politburo, another level up in the party hierarchy. The Politburo, in turn, elects a standing committee of usually seven or nine people, one of which is the general secretary of the party, in this case, Xi Jinping. Notice the phrase general secretary, not president. China is a party state, which means it has a government and a single ruling party. The two mirror each other in many ways, but they aren't the same. The state, confusingly, has its own version of the National Party Congress called the National People's Congress. And to make things even more confusing, multiple parties participate in the People's Congress, not just the Communist Party. But they're all members of a single united front, which means they coexist, not compete with the CCP. Anyway, just as the party congress helps elect a general secretary every five years in the fall on the party side, the People's Congress elects the country's president and premier every five years in the spring on the state side. Though, don't think of the party and state as entirely separate either. There's lots of overlap. Virtually everyone working for the Chinese state is a party member, but not all party members work for the state. After all, there are nearly 100 million party members. As general secretary, Xi Jinping is head of the party, and as president, he's head of the state. These are two different roles that could be filled by two different people, but they're not, which gives him the choice of which to use at any given moment. When Xi visits a foreign country, unless that country is, say, communist Cuba or North Korea, he does so as the president of China. That's technically true. He is, in fact, the president. But there's a growing movement in favor of always calling him general secretary. In China, the party is above the state. The People's Liberation Army reports directly to the party, not the government. A city's party secretary. Okay, yeah. So I think that was a good diagram uh, showing us just the relationship because it is a complex relationship with the whole yeah. party and state, and that there's an overlap, and there's the members, the actual membership, which is different to the people that get appointed, the actual delegates, and well as central committee members. So now, if you are listening or watching this, you have hopefully some idea as to how that works. Um, yeah. Sorry, Chris. I think I might have jumped or cut you off a, a bit earlier. So also, though, it was interesting that. He alluded to it there. He started it in with a negative tint, uh, the relationship between the party and the army. So right. the People's Liberation Army is not the army of the Chinese state. It is the military wing of Chinese Communist Party. Proudly mm -hmm. so. 
Um, I believe in this actual Congress, one of the resolutions was to strengthen that tie between the party and the, the army. And mm -hmm. this, this almost, as we alluded to at the beginning, uh, with these tabloids in India joking about a military coup, this is mm -hmm. why that can't happen. Mm -hmm. The idea that the army can overtake, overthrow the party, where the army is the party. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not separate, right? It's staffed by party. Yeah, party loyalty is a very big thing with the army, with the yeah. PLA. And yeah, sort of ideological training. Um, it reminds me mm -hmm. of the a quote by Thomas Sankara that without political... Mm -hmm. Training a soldier is a any soldier is a potential war criminal. That's it. That's it. That's it. Yeah. Without political. Yeah. Exactly. Without training. Without political ideology. Without. Without something. Without values. Yes. Yeah. Just, paraphrased, uh, obviously. Yeah. But. Just, uh, yeah no, I, I, I'm trying to. I'm also paraphrasing horribly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But yes, it's just a, uh, just a brute. Um, yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, so I mean, we've kind of given an, a description of what this Congress is, and obviously we've yeah. dealt with. The, 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 the low-hanging fruit that apparently was the most important thing that ever happened in the Congress. Of all, of all the things they discussed, of all the things that's happened in the last five years in terms of this, this, uh, this, 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 you know, the, the term of the, uh, the 19th um, Central Committee, the, the thing that happened on the last day apparently trumps everything, where a poor yeah. old Hu Jintao got taken out for medical reasons. Apparently that's, you know, that's, that's the only lens we can look through this with. Um, but yeah. it, so, it is unfortunate. Hopefully... If it is a case, as we suspect that yeah. it is because he's ill, then I'm just glad that he got to enjoy what is yeah. potentially yeah. his last Congress. Uh, somebody who was, at this point, dedicated his entire life to the service mm. of building a socialist China. I think he very much deserved yeah. to have seen this last one through. And I think that's the lens that we should be looking at this through. Um, yeah, yeah. It's sad yeah. That he went, but we're happy that he, that he came. Yeah, and I think also... People do criticize his 10 years for some some degrees of corruption and whatnot, and that's a fair criticism to make. But I think also, you know, you did have um, exceptional uh, economic growth at the time still. Um, the country definitely progressed. It didn't step back. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe they started the high-speed rail uh, system underneath him. So that's one of the, you know, one of the wonders of the world now, in my opinion. Um, and that started under his, his uh, tenure. So, yeah, and, and that's just a short list. I mean, the top of my head of things that happened under his his uh, tenure, obviously the Beijing Olympics and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, yeah. So I, I think um, I'm glad he got to see the Congress too. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing that I thought was significant um, that uh, changed because obviously there's been a few new people elected. In fact, the entire mm. standing committee is our new faces. Uh, not new yeah. in terms of the quite the ether. These they're just new to this role. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. So yeah. One of the interesting picks, I, I thought, was um, Lin Quen, who has been made the new premier. So he was the former governor of Shanghai. And he's obviously hmm. been the damage given this position. Here, what kind of support the Sorry, an advert sort of playing this, right? Carry on. That position based on the merit of his, of his last job. So I've got an article here from um, Bloomberg. So it's, uh, it's the top one. Yeah, I've got it. I've got it. Yeah. Uh, um, so it just shows how wrong these China watchers in the West are. That was said not long ago. If you want to understand things, you've got to, got to look from the beginning. Um, so she and bind over who to blame for COVID outburst. Uh, the premier of Shanghai, obviously, they're blaming him from a Western yeah. angle, from their lens. You've yeah. tanked the economy with your lockdown, your COVID lockdowns of Shanghai that have damaged the yeah. economy. Xi is going to be very annoyed at you and what's yeah. going to happen. So obviously, from the Chinese perspective of it, is this is people before economy. Yeah. COVID yeah. destroyed countless lives and did a tremendous amount of damage to every country's economy. Yes. But for China, the obvious thing, this is one of the big things where China's zero COVID policy is containment rather than in the West say, like, oh, let's open up early because the economy is doing bad. And then you get a huge spike yeah. of COVID. And like, oh, it's okay. Yeah. As long as it's the economy, that's all that seems to matter in the West. Where China was the opposite. It's like, we need to contain this. We need to stop people dying from it. We'll take, we'll, we'll bite the bullet. We'll take the hit in the economy. Yeah. But Bloomberg seems to think that Xi is going to right. be angry. And obviously that was complete 
false because now he's been made premier. Yes. Is yeah. No. No. Right. Yeah, yeah. West expected yeah. him to be punished for. I'm glad you found this um, this article because I had also read the same thing that um, this speculation that you know, he can't possibly appoint um, uh, Lee uh, as as on, onto the standing committee because of of the of the situation in Shanghai and here he is he's there <laughs> and now yeah. it's being it's being it's being drafted as a criticism like oh well she uh, obviously doesn't care about the economy and doesn't understand the economy because he's appointed Lee and and you're just like hold on a second he's already been in power for ten years. And there's been yeah. economic growth every year, even during COVID. <laughs> so I think he, yeah. he he's able yeah. somehow, or at least is delegating well enough that the economy is still fine. Um, but an interesting thing, yes, you, you just mentioned about COVID. Um, so I, I must say, I do think that by Chinese standards, the Shanghai lockdown was actually a disaster. I, I, I think that's a fair thing. I mean, by European standards, I mean, you know, people just died and people don't care. Um, you know, at least the governments in the West don't care. Um, so by, when I say by it was a disaster, I say by Chinese standards because other cities, Beijing, uh, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, Tianjin, Chengdu, many, many big cities, um, obviously not as big as Shanghai, but equally, you know, nearly as large. Um, yeah. now, Chongqing is actually arguably bigger, um, but they didn't have the same uh, issues where you had lockdowns for weeks and issues with the food delivery and stuff like that. So I do think it is fair to say that the, the, the lockdown was a, was a quite a disaster actually. But as you said, the whole point is to, was to try and save lives and to stop the outbreak of the virus in full. Um, yeah. if, if you're not aware, the Shanghai lockdown was actually more intense than the one in Wuhan, longer and, and more um, fraught with more problems. Um, so the reasoning for that though, is because of the, the death rate. So uh, I saw a, a, an interesting interview with someone speaking at a Chinese uh, guy speaking to Al Jazeera and he said um, okay well you had a million people die in America let's assume that China has the same response um, we have four times the population that's four million people that have to die uh, if we if we let it go and it, it might be worse we might be closer to something like you know an Indian statistic or something like that which which I think is higher um, but yeah so it's it, that's the problem with with uh, with this COVID response is that they have to, you know, make that decision. And, and you, if, if you know, if someone said, you know, it's a trolley problem, but, if the, you know, you, you can see, you know, there's, there's 4 million people that are going to have to die, or you open up the economy quickly. Uh, if you open up the economy, sorry, no, if you open up the economy quickly, you kill 4 million people. You open it up slowly, it makes things a bit difficult. People have to bear the brunt, but we're all bearing the, the brunt together. Um, you know, I mean, I personally had to, you know, make some sacrifices. I was in Beijing. I couldn't leave. I couldn't see family for two years. So, yeah, but at the end of the day, we didn't have people in oxygen tanks in the streets and, and mass graves. So yeah, uh, I think I think you can see the calculation. And and also this is quite. Um, if anyone dares now to say, ah, oh, the Chinese government only cares about the economy, they'll throw their people under the bus for the economy at any second. Really? They yeah. Close the economy. It cost them a lot of money. Um, and they rewarded the money. One of the men who did. Yeah. Exactly. And then they save the people. So, yeah, that, that's that's the Lee thing then. So this this Lee appointee. Um, so there's a whole bunch of, like you already said, that that um, most of the standing committee is actually new people. I think only two uh, went back on. So I'm going to put them up here. I've got a graphic here from the um, Global Times. Where is it? Here? No, it's from Reuters. Sorry. So there'll be a bit of um, bias here, a bit of uh, shade being cast on the party. So let's put this yeah. up here now so you can see them. Um, here we go. So obviously she in the middle there, and then you've got uh, Li Qiang, which I believe is him over here. This doesn't actually specify what direction <laughs> these images are. <laughs> so I'm not, not going to then gamble <laughs> and assume. I know that that's she, and I think that's Li. So I'll just stop there. But I'll read the names. You've got um, Zhao Leji, Wang Guning, uh, Cai Qi, Ding Xueqiang, and Li Xi. Uh, yeah, there we go. And that's that's them there. That's the seven seven people on the standing committee. So obviously, um, one of the criticisms, which I think is fair, so I, I don't want to stand here and just only blow China's trumpet and say how amazing and perfect everything is. I think I should criticize a bit. Uh, and people have mentioned this, there are very few women. Um, so obviously, the standing committee has no women. And uh, the Politburo this time as well has no women. So before the Politburo, so for the 19th Congress, the Politburo had one woman. She's had to retire because she's, I believe, 72. So now we have a situation where the Politburo has zero women, which, 
yeah, that's that's um, you know, yeah. it, it should be more women. Um, there but there's, there's two be. things. Yeah. Say. yeah, it's just one that, firstly, tokenism. You know, these people. If if there's a woman on the board, she sh she should be there for the right reasons on the the committee, uh, because she's you know uh, competent and good, not because she's just a token. We don't want to have tokenism. Um, so yeah, but I'm sure there are many competent, you know, members of the party who are women and who should be here. Um, so it is, it is, a, it is a bit of a shame. This I think that this is yeah. not uh, an advancement. However, what I will share then is that you do have um, a lot of. I'll, I'll look for this while you speak, Chris. Uh, if you want to say something about this, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So just with what you said with, with tokenism um, in, in the West, obviously it's a big thing that, that this government doesn't have enough. Um, women, people of colour, trans representation, so on and so forth. It, in the West, mm. the, the argument is that it needs to have one of each sort of flavour of people to be to be whole. Um, China it, it's, d doesn't have the same sort of social issues that have driven a lot of these sort of problems in the West to these points. From the set, offset in the Chinese Revolution, as, as Mao famous said, women hold, hold up half the sky. The idea of women's liberation was was there and emphasized and pushed from the word go. Um, so I don't think China has this issue of institutional sexism that is commonplace in the West. So mm. as much of the aesthetics, we look at this and say a, a bunch of men, there should be a wo woman. I, I want to sort of play devil's advocate and say, well, I think it's it's not that women have been excluded. It's just that out of sheer chance, mm. the people are there were better than the people who weren't this time round. Next mm. time round, mm. uh, yeah. So I think it's that if there were women who were who were candidates, unfortunately they just didn't yeah. make the cut. Not because they were women, just because they, they weren't the standards weren't high enough. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I do think that there is probably. Um, uh, there is still probably hurdles. No, probably there are. I think there are hurdles still with sexism, even even in China. Um, yeah, perhaps not to the same extent in other countries. But I still do think that there is um, a degree of, of of work to be done. I mean, if you think that 120 years ago, at the turn of the 19th century, women had were having their feet bound and yeah. um, you know and practices like that under the imperial system, um, it takes time to break those kinds of things. And and, the, and to be honest, that's where the, the party, I think, comes in then. The party you know, did a lot of work to break those kinds of habits and traditions and uh, backwardness. Um, so, yeah, but there's still work to be done. I think, you, you know, you can't just arrive all of a sudden um, with with new culture. Um, no. Even, even the Cultural Revolution didn't really uh, create the, maybe as, as much as it wanted to in terms of changing uh, culture. Um, yeah, but this, this one's quite a road, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's a journey. It's a journey. Um, so this one, I think, is a, is a as much as the current uh, Politburo does not have any women on it. Sadly, um, there is progress though uh, in terms of the delegates. So the broader infrastructure, party infrastructure, and membership coming up from the bottom, you're seeing a growing um, percentage of women. So uh, this talks about obviously uh, 33.6 percent from front lines of work and production. So you're talking about Actual factory workers and farmers, um, as well as ethnic minorities, so people you know from from the mountains and from all sorts of the other um, autonomous regions, uh, who are coming and, and speaking and having their voice heard at these at, at the Congress. Um, uh, then it also talks about the other women. So where's the statistic? One second. Uh, it's been going up. Here we go. So let me just go back to the farming thing here. So of course you've got. Uh, so the 771 of them are from frontline work and production. So 192 of them are workers, uh, 84%. 85 are farmers, 3.7%. And then 266 professional technical staff is accounting for 11.6%. So talking earlier about um, that consultative democracy, I mean, this is pretty good to have just common workers and farmers there in the Congress. Um, but yeah, coming back to the female thing, so female delegates were at 619 delegates, which is 68 more than the 19th Congress. So more than the last Congress, 90, uh, 68 more. So it's increased by 2.8% from this one to the last one. So it is on the rise. Um, the female delegates are increasing 
and and obviously and as time goes on um you know over the next 10 years or 15 years those delegates will grow and that will then equal more um people on the, the with the Politburo as well as eventually the standing committee and hopefully one day uh, general secretary um yeah uh, i think that's just that's just the way it goes i think we've covered this quite well um yeah there be yeah. anything else to that chris yeah. Um, so uh, just just uh, just on that same topic, I've got one links here, that bottom one here. Of... So just to clarify that I think there are more <laughs> common workers on the actual um, within the delegates. They just counted as uh, I don't know whether because they're in a party role and an administrative role, so they still do a job within a, a, a you know sort of government office. Um, yeah. I think they just singled out those specific people because they are um frontline real frontline sort of sort of uh, very frontline work <laughs> yeah if that's the term you want to use hmm. yes yeah, so i just wanted to just to hi highlight another one just to sort of point point out that they are making sort of strides with um rep female representation in the party so we've got mm. a mm -hmm. one here on that link meets the um yuga delegate the delegate who teaches drone operations at the military uh, so obviously, the, mm. so obviously this was uh, something worth highlighting because obviously, the narrative that's going in, in the West of all sorts of words that they throw throw of the region, uh, the most the yeah. funniest one that I always hear of genocide. So this is yes. the politest genocide in history, like a genocide that results in no dead, <laughs> and where everybody comes out of concentration camps with degrees and jobs and. <laughs> That's like, this, yeah. this, this right. sounds fantastic. I, I want to go to this concentration camp if that is the case. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. to be honest, I don't think we have enough time to, to, to go into the, the genocide no, discussion. This, the, this the, is yeah, an entire different, different conversation. And also, then we're also, doing, we're also letting, letting the critics decide the narrative. I mean, and there's, there's a lot of positive things here to, 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 to discuss and to look at. And so, actually, let's, let's get into that stuff, I think. Um, We've got uh, loads of things that was said at the opening speech. So he talked about the economy. He talked about the environment. He talked about um, COVID-19. He talked about technological uh, development. So scaling up uh, high level development rather than just, you know, you know, tons of bricks talking about, you know, microchips and scaling up um, the development and production of the country and, and all sorts of stuff. So it was, it was a two hour speech. I, I'm not going to try and condense it, but I did. Um, want to show you some of what does that reforestation actually look like? So they talk about fighting climate change. They talk about um, how they're changing um, the landscape and, and reforesting China. And I've seen some of this with my own eyes. So I'm just going to show you a general video of what it looks like. And then I'll show you a specific place which I saw with my own eyes. And it's, it's amazing. Okay, so I think we've got enough of a, an idea there. So, yeah, reforested an area the size of Ireland. Um, and that's just within the particular uh, frames of this video. That's not all they've done. They've, they've planned to do more. Um, so there's a particular place in China called uh, Yan'an. It's in Shanxi province. And it's actually quite famous because during the Great March, uh, not the Great March, the Long March, um, yeah, you're watching that. Okay, cool. Uh, this is the place they actually stopped. So when they finished Long March, they arrived here, and this is where they, they sort of, you know, Mao stayed in a cave, and they all sort of started plowing the land to try and survive, and that was their revolutionary base. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this place was, it looked like basically this sort of, you know, extremely, um, that's her base, sorry, uh, extremely dry. So from the sky, you can see, you know, from satellite imagery, this would look like in 1989 and 2008, 2000, and then so on, uh, you know, 
to the present. And this place went from being this dry, um, sort of with shrubs place, not very nice, not very, um, you know, lush. And it's now green, almost like a rainforest, really. And uh, when I went there, I went there with some of the older, a, a, a guy who'd actually was born in China, but he was, his parents were Indian revolutionaries who'd come to, you know, join the revolution in 1949 and whatnot. And then he was born there. And he went to this place, Yanan, in the 70s. And he said it was, yeah, it was, it was a dust bowl. And, uh, yeah. you know, we went there then in 2020 and it was lush and green. So this thing is real, this reforestation. And the statistic that comes to mind is that um, five, uh, the world's forests have increased by 5% and more than a fifth of that, more than 20% of that has been um, from China. China. China alone growing that. Out of all the world's uh, countries, uh, China did that, that threw in that, that lot, threw in that effort. So yeah, so that that's stuff real. The, the stuff that they talked about the opening address um, in terms of for, reforestation. Um, yeah, is there anything you to, yeah. On here, so mm. this bottom link that I've sent, just to highlight on that. So that video you just showed, mm. Um, mm. and that video it seems to show a lot of um, sort of civilians. I imagine a lot of them would have been party cadres, um, planting mm. trees. But this link here, mm. at the bottom, from We Forum, We Forum, uh, China has sent sixty thousand soldiers to plant trees. So this was 2018, so just before the, yeah, last, the, the, yeah so this is during the time between the last and, and the current Congress. Yes. Yeah, this is the, the, the just, just after the last Congress. Yeah, yeah. This is, yeah, 19th, this is within the 19th, so this is the Congress that's just finished. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's, since, it's since amazing, the, like, plant trees. Wow. The, the things yeah. that you can use a people's army for that, a people's yeah, army is right. to I mean, serve the people. <laughs> exactly. I mean, this is this is yeah, great example, man. This is this is brilliant. I mean, exactly. I mean, what it's the kind of stuff you always think. Oh, the salt, bring in the army. They should be doing this. And yeah. I mean, for some reason, in the UK and other countries, they just don't do that. I mean, I know they help out during the um, floods and stuff, and and during sort of fires, and if there's a shortage or whatever, yeah, they help out. But like, I mean. This is pretty great stuff. I mean, this is the kind yeah. of stuff that we, you know would make great use of, of the military. And I mean, also, it's not like it's meaningless work. You know, it's still training of some some yeah, form of history exercise, um, as an output. You know, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. That's, that, that's what people think. With, with China, um, a lot of people's opinions are based. Are usually a, an image of China is usually twenty years out of date. Uh, so a lot of people have mm -hmm. ideas of um, Chinese cities with huge clouds of smog which a lot of the time you'll be able to test this isn't the case and hasn't been for 20 years right. time uh, you're, you're actually absolutely right so i went there in 2019 and i thought ah oh, where are all these factories and i kept asking my my colleagues my chinese colleagues i'm like so where are the factories? i want to go see where everything's made where, where are the factories where's it all happening and obviously there are industrial zones it is happening yeah. but it's nowhere near beijing it's nowhere near shanghai it's nowhere near Guangzhou. I mean, you have sort of light industrial sort of warehouses where people are doing stuff, but I, I struggle to find the, the sta you know, the smokestack lined roof and, uh, you know, with this soot falling down. No, I, you, you don't really see that. Um, there's a handful of places, I think Tangshan, where they make steel might be a bit like that, but even that might be an outdated um, uh, perspective. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they, yeah. They, they're, move they're moving far beyond these things. Yeah. That when, when people talk about, oh, China is one of the world's biggest uh, producers of pollution. So, well, they're also, in that, if you could sense, one of the biggest reverses of it. They've done more yeah. to combat yeah. pollution and climate change yeah. than anyone else. And yeah. this, whole, yeah. this whole silly argument that I always find where people just think that China is a country as equal to Britain of our tiny mm -hmm. population of 65 million. 20% yeah. of the world's yeah. population live in China. So of course yeah. like, that popular yeah. population. Yeah. Well, that's that's the power. thing. It's it's important to remember the per capita statistic rather than yeah. the total. Yes, China, well, China is the biggest polluter as a total, but they also have the most people, so that makes sense. Um, yeah. And if you go there per capita, yeah, 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 that that's when it goes like, hold on. So I don't know, a British person is making is producing five times as much as a Chinese person, or three times as much. And also, then there's the other awkward fact is like. The reason it's so high in China is because they're making stuff for you. <laughs> that's yeah. that's your stuff you know, that, that you're living off. You're the one. You're the market that's demanding these products. Um, yeah, yeah. 
So and that, yeah, again, good. is bringing us on to sort of a geopolitical side of it. Uh, so for mm. years, we've, we've, we've all known the sort of um, cultural meme of cheap tap stamped with made in China, your, your big pens, your, your yellow yeah. razors that break. Um, obviously, yeah. during the last Congress, um, she uh, laid out his vision of a revitalized sort of branding of made in China, of quality goods. And this is yes. where we saw this economic sabotage by, by all intents and purposes by the West. So one of the biggest brands of phones at the time was the up and coming brand Huawei, which was easily oh, Huawei, yeah. becoming a global rival to brands like Samsung and other, mm. and other Android phones. And obviously mm. America got the Canadians to arrest their company president, hold them for a couple of years and then eventually release release them back to China. But in that time, the American government had managed to co-opt Google and a few other companies and brands mm. to basically pull software. You can still get a Huawei phone in the West, but the damage yeah. has been so bad to their brand. And it's just this, this chipping away economic sabotage. Yeah. The whole yeah, idea was China made good phones, and they didn't want yeah. that... <laughs> The argument of, yeah. oh, China, we're using spy software. It's like, well, <laughs> aren't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. In terms yeah, of yeah, service yeah. on this, telling me that you're spying yeah. on me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think, you know, one of the big examples for this um, misconception of cheap Chinese goods, obviously there are lots of cheap Chinese goods. Yes, they do exist. But the idea yeah. that there's nothing good made in China is rubbish. Drones. So when people think of drones, if you think of a drone, you're probably thinking of a DJI drone. And the DJI ones are the best. So I had this misconception. I thought the DJI drones were made in America. And then people were talking about, oh, go get a cheap Chinese one. Don't get the DJI one. Meanwhile, if you look at DJI, it's, it's from Shenzhen. It's a Chinese company. And it's it makes the best drones. It is the best technology in the world. Um, no one makes better drones than DJI. Uh, and also on the phone thing, um, I mean, I've always, uh, I don't know, I've been studying, I've had a smartphone for like, I don't know, since... 2014 probably and i had an iphone my first iphone back then the iphone 5s and uh, i thought it was good it's a good phone i mean it's still made in china as well just by the way but um uh, i my girlfriend got a huawei and the camera is exceptional it is a great piece of it is a great phone um yeah and this is also where it comes into the discussions about like you know people say oh you know globalized trade should be uh, you know we want everyone to have a you know free competition with each other um, that's that's our ideology, at least from the West, you know. So that that's the, the supposed ideology is to have trade, open trade, um, under sort of neoliberalism. Uh, but you know, when they're losing uh, and they're not, you yeah. know, the ones making the best goods, then it becomes, oh well, uh, uh, you know, you're cheating or uh, it's it's spying or, or some excuse. They'll make up stuff. Um, yeah, trade tariffs this, come in. <laughs> right oh yeah exactly exactly i've actually got four things i want to show you quickly just in in, in um in sort of back to back um one of them is the an image of what i was talking about so yanan the revolutionary base just a picture of what it looked like so I, I found this early and i failed to find it so there you go that's what it looked like brown desolate uh dusty and there you are you wow. know uh green and beautiful uh in 2012 so it actually yeah. looks even better now even greener but there you go that's one the next one is, yeah, I said earlier that China's life expectancy has uh, up surpassed the U.S. There you go. There it is. Um, 77.1 for the Chinese and 76.1 for the Americans. And that's primarily due to COVID. So there you go. That's why they didn't open up the economy. So, because, you know, people didn't die if they did. Um, then this one here, actually, sorry, the next one is, this one here is from the United Nations uh, Human Development Reports. United, United Nations Human Development, basically. And um, I'm not going to read the whole report, report, don't worry. But it's a, it's a very interesting statistic here. So they, they talk about uh, from its founding in 1949, and especially since the beginning of the reform and opening up, China's Human Development Index, which is the me measure by which you count economic life uh, expectancy, health, and everything to calculate human development rather than just money, um, the HDI, Value increased from 0 0.410 in 1978 to 0 0.752 in 2017. This is the quote I wanted to say. It is the only country to have moved from the low human development category to the high human development category 
since UNDP first began analyzing data uh, in 1990. So that's a pretty amazing achievement. Yeah. And the last thing I'm going to show you of the four things I'm going to show you, just to come before I get back to you, uh, yeah, we can finish where you like, uh, is this one here. So this is from Harvard. Um, this is a research done by the Ash Center Research Team. And they did this over a long period of time. They surveyed Chinese people's um, feelings toward the government, central and local. And uh, they did, you know, 32,000 respondents in this research, okay? And they did it between 2003 and 2016, okay? Um, and they found that there was 95.5% uh, of respondents were either relatively satisfied or highly satisfied with Beijing. So, <laughs> I mean, it's not even just two thirds, you know, 60% approval rating for a government is good, uh, yeah. usually around the world. 95.5% is, I mean, you almost, almost can't beat that. Um, yeah, there is a slight um, uh, more uh, dissatisfaction with local government, particularly with the rural guys. Um, but they also found that the rural um, respondents to this uh, had a better outlook on inequality, that they felt that the central government was going to deal with inequality. Um, they had a better outlook than that than the guys, the coastal elites did. So the guys who would be the victims of inequality think that they actually have good chances of, um, you know, not being yeah. left behind, basically. And also and I think, huge. I think some of that goes uh, into people not being able to see the big picture. Um, mm. Like we said earlier on, where somebody in one field won't understand the work of some another field. So I watched a video of, um, it was a, a documentary on CGTN about Chinese sort of surveillance and how it can be used to basically monitor when somebody falls into uh, poverty in real time. So they can mm. basically say, well, that area needs immediate action. And it was just an amazing use of uh, the surveillance technology that the West is so scared of China having. Um, mm -hmm. But we saw, showed a, a group of farmers who basically were living, raising cattle on a mountain. That they Basically, this mountain had become unsustainable due to mudslides and things. So the cadres went in and said, look, we're going to help you move into an apartment. It's going to be modern. We're going to help you get a job. And, of course, this guy was just complaining the whole time. But... They've come, take them a house, and, and it's like sometimes it's like the idea of you can give someone a fiver and they'd complain that it's in coins. So like you're just yeah. not seeing that benefit you. I promise it does. You're just complaining mm -hmm. now that you've had to leave a home that your yeah. family's been there. For, I can understand why you're upset of that, but, but I promise you, mm -hmm. it's going to slide into the mud eventually, and that's why they've moved. Mm -hmm. they, they've not mm -hmm. done it to be horrible to you. Mm -hmm. There's just data yeah. that you haven't seen. <laughs> Yeah, 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 one hundred percent, one hundred percent. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't have any, actually, I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> so, that one. Um, yeah, in terms of the actual, um, some of the stuff passed at the Congress as well. I know we've talked about um, the third term that he's that he's been given, uh, and we've talked about the speech that he gave, the opening speech, talking about the environment and the achievements of the last five years. Some of the things they passed though, I think this is really interesting. So this is where you get into sort of almost uncharted territory in my opinion um, with a socialist nation. So you obviously have, you know, the reference points of the Soviet Union and Cuba and China itself in terms of how to build socialism or even what socialism is. Um, there was a very big part of Xi's speech, the opening speech talking about Marxism is the guiding uh, ideology or thought of China. Um, and he said it in different ways many times. So anyone contesting that he's not a Marxist and this is not Marxism, um, you should go and tell Xi uh, because apparently he's, he's, he's you know, believing something. I don't know. <laughs> but nonetheless, he then, uh, well, the Congress then talks about the common prosperity goals. So Marxism, as she said in the speech, should be applied to its circumstances, to its conditions. It's not a set of policies and ideas that are, you know, someone tried them somewhere at some point, and those, that is it. That's, that's all the socialism could possibly be, um, whether that's price control or state ownership or, um, 
you know, tariffs or there's a thousand policy tools, or if it's just even ownership models, there's, there's a lot going on, um, you know, in how you can govern. That means socialism has a far broader, um, you know, there's different ways, many ways to skin a cat or you yes. know, uh, in, that, in that sense. But so this, this is one of the goals that came out, the so common prosperity goal. Okay. So a new development pattern added in, in, into uh, the actual constitution. So, yeah. So I'm trying to try and catch some of the, the phrases here. I don't know if you want to comment on what I just said as well, uh, Chris, in terms of Marxism and uh, its application. I don't know. Yeah. So obviously this is something that if any anyone spent any uh, prolonged period of time on social media or, or any sort of left book, bread tube sort of channels where you're constant bickering of Western leftist, China's not socialist. Mm. or th th well, That's not even hardly the argument of the, the Communist Party has abandoned Marxist-Leninism because X, Y, Z. And the idea that some sort of American socialist who's read a bit of Marx and Lenin knows better than someone on the ground there. And that we've got mm. such, even, even in our, our the Communist Party in Britain, like theatricians like Harpel Barra, who have studied this through his entire life, was hesitant to write his book, which was an amazing book on on a so, social market socialism in China. I think he actually opened the book saying that basically he was coerced into writing this by by the party, and that he didn't want to do it, didn't want to write it. And if anyone's not yeah. read the book, it's an amazing book that I rec recommend you reading. Um, Mm. But yeah, it sort of helps paint this picture of China's development, where it's come from, and that mm -hmm. the reason why the market sort of opened in the way they did, this very controlled way they did. The the narrative mm -hmm. that people paint that they just open the doors and let capitalists sort of do what they want isn't true. Right. They yeah. are under extreme scrutiny from the government. Even capitalists mm -hmm. like Jack Ma will will speak in favor of communist rule say well we're allowed to operate but we don't hold any political power that's that's mm. the difference mm. 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 where in the west yeah. capitalist power controls political power in china yeah. it's the complete opposite way around obviously yeah. we all yeah. a lot of us want that sort of dogmatic history view and of bringing back some sort of cultural revolution and marching with our red flags and our little red books and smashing the shop for windows but it's just it, it's yes. not realistic yes. and it's not where china is yeah yeah 100 100 yeah and i think we you know we've looked at the fact that you've got a very big effort to make sure that frontline workers are there as we saw earlier um but there was no sort of smoking gun that says oh look here's x capitalists and y capitalists and they have more important seats than anyone else if, if that was there you'd have um I'm sure the, the the mainstream press would be all over it, um, you know, saying, "Look, here's the billionaire communists, um, all of them together. They're all billionaires. They're all um, princelings and whatnot." Uh, yeah, th th that narrative has not at least been shoved in our faces so far yet, yeah. um, because I don't think it's true. I don't think I don't think they can do it. If they could, they probably would try. Um, yeah. So this thing about the um, common prosperity, as I said, the skim read here. So obviously, the the actual meat and bones of that policy hasn't been drafted yet as the uh polymatter video said earlier this is more of an ideological and sort of a where is the ship going meeting where they sort of cast the, the big vision um but it does mention allude to something here that it talks about how um international flows and domestic needs um will be balanced to sort of be in more harmony and also talks about ba basic socialist economic systems including the system under which public ownership is the mainstay and diverse forms of ownership developed together. The system under which distribution, according to work, is the mainstay while multiple forms of distribution exist alongside it and the socialist market economy are important pillars of socialism characteristics. So I think this has to, you know, be unpacked, which I don't think we have time for today. But you can see in the discussion about public ownership being the mainstay alongside other forms of ownership, right? And then you can also see uh, the distribution, according to work, obviously um, being the mainstay, uh, uh, sorry, is the mainstay while all the forms of distribution exist alongside it. So it alludes to other forms of distribution. So, you know, if you if you want, you can maybe see a hint here to, um, what is it, the, the, the famous Marx quote, the one about um, 
work. Come on, help me out, Chris. Um, <laughs> from each according to his ability to each according to, each his, need. to his need. I uh, wonder which one you were getting at. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. I, was, I was actually also choosing which one actually is, is the two. You know. <laughs> In real not, time. Not, not, the, not the one about eating, the starving people that aren't working. But no, this one. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, th that's that's an interesting piece. Then I think, you know, other, in the closing address, he talked about greater miracles on a new journey, so confidence uh, and another uh, amendment. Um, and I think what you want to talk about here is, of course, the first centenary goal was the, uh, the, the creating of a moderately pr prosperous society and the abolishing of absolute poverty, which was achieved already. The second centenary goal then is the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, uh, and the building of a um, moderately prosperous socialist society in all respects. Um, so that's what the mission is now. But the great rejuvenation thing is obviously talks about Taiwan, which I think you alluded to earlier, uh, Chris. Yes, so that's... Uh, um, go ahead. The sort of big point that we, we, I kind of mm. wanted to drive to. Mm. Because obviously a lot of what was said at the Congress regarding Taiwan, a lot of it is just reiterating... Um, positions are already standing. A lot of it really hasn't changed from the Chinese perspective. So, Z, we insist on striving for the prospect of peaceful reunification with the greatest sincerity and best efforts, but we will never promise to give up the use of force and reserve the option to take all necessary measures. That is a far cry from we will use force. That is... Mm. We... As it's exactly what it says in the tin, we want we we'll strive for peaceful reunification. Yeah, yeah. That's how it always yeah, is. Yeah. How it always should be. You never rule out anything because if you rule out anything, then you, you're playing with one hand behind your back. Even yeah. if you have ruled out something, you, you don't tell them. <laughs> you don't tell mm -hmm. the, the, your opponent, and the opponent on this scale isn't Taiwan. It is America. They're the ones who exactly. are. The fact that Nancy Pelosi did that meeting um, a few months ago where she flew to Taiwan and it was an incredible spectacle. The fact that Joe Biden told her no, the fact the military told her no. I, I myself was watching the entire thing. I found a website that let me track the plane. Yes. <laughs> My girlfriend came in to ask me why I was watching this plane. I'm waiting for it to get shot down, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, like, yeah. She, I do what she loves, starting wars and earning millions of dollars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it served yeah. no purpose, it gained nothing. And it's the equivalent of China going to meet Confederate separatists in the South of America and act like they're a country when they're not. So it's like, we're up here, yeah. this is the government. You recognise that China is the government, and you have done since you Nixon admit helps them enter... The UN in yes. 89, I believe. 70, no, before that. Uh, 72. Uh, 72. 70, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 When the People's Republic essentially took the Republic of China, which is the official name for Taiwan, they still call mm. themselves to this day the Republic of China. Yeah. But they're not a country <laughs> by their own admission. Well, and yeah, they're not uh, uh, independence by their own admission. <laughs> Yeah, um, the, the entire thing with, with the US and Taiwan is ridiculous. I mean, yeah. like you said, we don't recognize this as an independent country. We've just flown there and we just send guns there. And, you know, strategic ambiguity. That's, that's don't, yeah, don't, yeah. I mean, what, what even is that? And we all know it. I mean, it's, it's bizarre. It's, 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 it's like it someone just... keeping a weird animal in their room and, and you're sort of saying, <laughs> oh, what animal? Like, no, we all know it's there. Look, you've, you've put a bowl of food out there. You know, you, you, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it just it goes into this idea of economic sabotage. And that's all what it's about. Mm. The idea that the American government, the American military, give a damn about the lives of Taiwanese people. That's not what this is about. Mm. They'd happily, if, if it came down to China putting an embargo around Taiwan where nothing could get in, America could sit and watch that happen. With no skin off their nose. That's not what this is about. This is about mm. America antagonizing China and not allowing China to to grow or to, to sort of 
flex its strength in any sort of way in its own territory. The fact that America yeah. think that they can send battleships into Chinese sea. So, oh, we, we're just showing you that we're here. So mm. if China did this mm. to you, this would be an absolute outrage. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, mate. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this is always the thing, right? If you had warships sailing between Cuba and Florida, you know, that strip of water there, imagine if anyone, yeah. Russia, China, whoever, was sailing ships around Cuba's, you know, waters, the Cuba's waters, you can, you know, they can do what they want, um, you know, sailing around there, right next to Florida, right next to the States, it would be war. It would be, it would be instant. Uh, there would be war. I mean, they did that. I mean, the Cuban Missile Crisis is essentially that. Um, you know, yeah. a sovereign nation, Cuba, using its territory as it wishes, uh, being essentially, uh, you know, uh, blockaded for daring to, you know, have an ally that would protect them. Yeah, yeah. And it always makes me laugh that the Cuban Missile Crisis is, is called that and not the Turkish Missile Crisis. Because it sort of forgets yes. that the Cuban Missile yeah. Crisis only happened in response to America putting nuclear missiles in Turkey. Okay. It sort yeah, of forgives that by in, in virtue of calling it the Cuban Missile Crisis. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. Well, so, I think, um, yeah, do you have anything else to add? With, with what um, she actually proposed for uh, Taiwan, uh, the idea yeah. of yeah, we emphasized that the level of autonomy that Taiwan had, it, so it wouldn't be sort of integrated. He was, he was basically offering it the same sort of system that Macau and Hong Kong, Hong Kong have got of this. Yeah, uh, one country, two systems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which, regardless of what people look at with Hong Kong, they always forget that Macau loves this system. The issues that mm -hmm. we see in Hong Kong don't exist in Macau. They're mm. almost polar opposites in terms of their relationship to Beijing. And a lot mm -hmm. of it is because of the um, sort of foreign interference that Hong Kong still has yeah. from the American and the British consulates there. Yeah, I think there's an important point to make about the Hong Kong thing specifically. So obviously it's it's quieted down now and it's, um you know, settled the issues, essentially settled at least for yeah. a few more years before the, the West can pay for some new protesters. But um, this interview given by, um, I don't know the name of the general, but Chinese guy in Beijing, he said, what country would accept a separatist movement organizing openly on the streets and attacking and burning and doing all sorts of things? Because it wasn't, you know, yes, there was uh, discussions about upholding the basic law and, and so certain privileges that you can have in Hong Kong, etc. But there was a very loud and very prominent um, separatist element to it. And that's then also it. a foreign-backed element too. Um, yeah, the new uh, endowment for democracy that's you know, everywhere, yeah. which is based on CIA. But yeah, no country uh, would accept that. I mean, and even in Europe, um, the Catalan movement, the guys in Barcelona, they've all been locked up. Um, that movement has been crushed. Yep. Um, that's in the EU because the EU understands if you start allowing separatist movements to organize and do that kind of stuff, it, it starts, uh, opens a can of, a can of worms. Uh, yeah. and, you know, very few countries are willing to accept that. Um, exactly. Yeah. It's not unreasonable for a country to be able to protect its own, uh, integ mm. integral sovereignty. Mm. If we had militant, uh, separatists in Cornwall threatening up, mm. The things at Hong Kong, well, we I dare say we'd act the exact same way there. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Cornish rebellion, but yeah, I've um, I, I, I've uh, actually I've got enough. Well, I think we've said enough for tonight. We can maybe have another session on China if if people want us to have a a deep dive on a specific thing because there's obviously lots of awesome, interesting topics. Whether that's how the economy works in terms of I don't know percentages and how much the state plays and how it plays its role and currently whether you want to talk about the cultural revolution, there's loads of interesting, um, you know, it is the biggest um, country in the world and it's the biggest communist party in the world. Um, so it is a very interesting and very, um, you know, something that we can talk a lot about. So yeah, if you are watching and you yeah. want us to discuss something, just put it in the comments. Um, but yeah, Chris, do you have any final thoughts on this one? Or Just to say as well, at this point, the majority of communist history now falls within the borders of China. At this point, China's uh, lasted longer than the Soviet yes. Union. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah, it's a very uh, something that we can talk a lot about. But yeah, um, if you are watching, thank you for watching and like, share, subscribe. Uh, please do subscribe. Some of you watching, we know that you don't subscribe. You are. I have statistics, and they tell me that See you. not everyone is, is subscribed. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you very much, and thanks, Chris. And thank we'll catch much, you Rich. next week.
Uh, next, next week, week, I think, Chris, if, 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 if you have a massive disagreement, you can tell me, Bolsonaro and Lula, um, the election, I believe, will be finished by next week, or at least, I don't know, wrapping up. So I think that's probably what we will discuss. If not, we'll change the topic and update you uh, on the channel at some point. But yeah, thank you very much for watching. Yeah. See you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.